And there you have it with those bells on Wall Street. Markets have closed the day, continuing their slide with the S&P falling into bear market territory and the Dow tumbling nearly 1,000 points. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I am Kristen Welker. It has been a very busy day in Washington with the January 6th committee holding its second hearing on former President Trump's lies about the 2020 election. We've also got new developments in Congress as a bipartisan group of lawmakers say they've reached a deal on new gun legislation. I will speak with one of those senators about what happens next. That's coming up. But first, with the S&P 500 falling more than 20 percent from its uh, highs, gas prices above $5 a gallon on average and rising inflation. We do want to start with the breaking news on Wall Street with NBC News senior business analyst and the host of the 11th hour on MSNBC, Stephanie Rule. Stephanie, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. So help us put today into context, if you would. Does a bear market mean a recession is coming? What do you make of today's numbers? Kristen Walker, I don't hear you if you're speaking to me, so I'm just going to start speaking. I'm going <laughs> to guess it's 4 p.m., and what am I here to talk about? The markets and the economy. Clearly, it's a really rough day in the markets, and why? Well, fears of recession and what could cause this recession? Inflation. And all eyes really are on the Fed. The, the two-day meeting we're expecting to take place this week, why is it important? Because we can talk all day long and tomorrow about what is the White House going to do, but the clearest and really only big lever the government has is with the Federal Reserve, and that's to raise interest rates. We're expecting they're going to do that this week. The question is how much? And Kristen, it's really, really a balancing act, threading the needle. If they raise rates too much. It makes it very difficult and expensive to borrow hard to do business. So that could tip us into recession. But if they don't raise rates enough, well, then prices could continue to rise. And at this rate, it's getting harder and harder for people to afford things. Just today, Mark Zandi analyzed gas prices. And compared to last year, it's costing American families about $160 more a month to pay for gas. So you might think, wow, are people going to stop traveling this summer? And the answer thus far is no. We're expecting a huge huge travel summer because remember people have saved up a lot and one thing that would slow the economy is if we said these prices are so high I'm not going to pay them but at this point we're still paying them and prices are very high. All right, Stephanie Rule, thank you for that. We will, of course, continue to watch what happens on Wall Street very closely. But we do want to turn now from Wall Street to Capitol Hill, where the January 6th committee held its second hearing in less than a week, focusing on former President Trump's embrace of lies and conspiracy theories surrounding the 2020 election. In testimony and recorded depositions, we heard some of the former president's closest advisors describe how they had told him he had, in fact, lost the election and that he continued claiming of election fraud were completely unfounded and in some cases reckless. The Stowell, after the votes were counted, who won the presidential election of 2020? Uh, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. of the great state of Delaware. So as, as the week wore on, um, as we paid attention to those numbers every single multiple times a day, um, you know, internally, um, you know, I, I, I was feeling less confident for sure. What was your view on the state of the election at that point? Um, you know, uh, very, very, very bleak. I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was My opinion then and my opinion now is that uh, the election was not stolen by fraud. There were instances where the president would say, people are telling me this, or I've heard this, or I saw on television, you know, this, this impropriety in Atlanta or Pennsylvania or something. And we, we were in a position to say, uh, our people have already looked at that, and we know that you're getting bad information, that that's, that's not correct. In today's hearing, we heard extensive testimony from former Attorney General Bill Barr and other advisors about how they tried to convince former President Trump that he was chasing false allegations and lies. They described some of those conspiracy theories as completely nuts and, quote, idiotic. We also heard the committee's deposition with Trump's former campaign manager, Bill Stepien, who was supposed to testify in person but had to cancel because his wife went into labor. Here he is describing how he tried to steer Mr. Trump away from falsely declaring victory on election night. 
my belief, my recommendation was to say that votes were still being counted. It's too early to 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 tell. Um, too early to, to call the race, but um, you know we are uh, proud of the race we we run we ran, um, and we you know think we're think we're in a in, in good position, um, and we'll have more to say about this you know the next day or the next day whenever we had something to say. And did anybody who was a part of that conversation disagree with your message? Yes. Who is that? The, the president disagreed with that. And near the end of the proceedings, committee member Zoe Lofgren turned her focus to a different alleged deception, the campaign's efforts to raise money to fight the unfounded claims of election fraud, an effort she called the big ripoff. These fundraising schemes were also part of the effort to, to disseminate the false claims of election fraud. Throughout the committee's investigation, we found evidence that the Trump campaign and its surrogates misled donors as to where their funds would go and what they would be used for. So not only was there the big lie, there was the big ripoff. Soundbite that is getting a lot of attention. On the question of whether the committee is laying out a potentially criminal case, Attorney General Merrick Garland told reporters today that federal prosecutors are closely monitoring these hearings. NBC's Ali Vitali is on Capitol Hill. Also with us is NBC's Brandi Zadrozny. She covers misinformation and extremism for us. Washington Post investigative reporter and NBC News contributor Carol Lenig. And with me on set is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Thanks to all of you for being here on this very big day. Ali, I do want to start with you on Capitol Hill. Take us inside of the room. What were your big takeaways today? What did we learn? Well, Kristen, we knew going into this that it was going to be a day where the committee spent a lot of time and resources establishing what the former president knew and what he did anyway. In effect, saying that he was told by every member of his inner orbit, save for Rudy Giuliani and several lawyers who were aligned with Giuliani, that he had lost the election and that he continued to pursue these claims of fraud anyway. Of course, the introduction of the financial piece of it is also really important, especially as some prosecutors wonder whether whether or not the committee is trying to lay the groundwork here for some kind of financial fraud case that the Department of Justice could pick up. I'm sure that's something that Danny and others who actually have legal degrees can speak to here. But I also just think from the way that the day began, it was yet another day, and I think you and I and all of the rest of us lived these for five years during the Trump era in Washington. It was a day where when Bill Stepien was no longer testifying, when the committee start got pushed back, I had an aide say to me, you know, if we wrote it this way, you guys would have said we jumped the shark. Effectively saying that it's all stranger than fiction the way that this always plays out when it comes to Trump and his allies. Certainly it was no exception today. But in the room, I think one of the things that was really striking to me as I sat there was the fact that Yes, we heard from the former president during the first primetime hearing, but not extensively, nothing more than a quick bite from one of his rally speeches. Today, instead, during the first moment that they played extensive remarks of the former president saying that he had won the election anyway, we did see from some people in the room sort of this perking up at the sound of the former president's voice. I think it's really stunning. He has been the central focus here, but hearing it from him putting together what his aides were telling him and juxtaposing that with what he said anyway, I think that was really striking both for people in the room and for viewers. I think you're absolutely right, Ali. Also striking that the committee ended on images of January yes. 6th yet again to refocus the conversation around that. Carol, Ali makes the good point that uh, in Trump world, sometimes truth can be stranger than fiction. And here we saw that again today, where Bill Stepien, the star witness who was supposed to appear in person, didn't show up. As we said, his wife went into labor committee members wishing him well, as, of course, is everyone right now. But look, the committee played portions of his tape testimony where he said he told the former president not to declare victory on election night. He talked about a meeting on November 7th when he said, look, the numbers are just not in your favor. How compelling was it to hear from Stepien, even though it was taped? Some people say it actually wound up being more effective. 
I think it did ultimately become more effective. We'll see about Trump supporters and whether or not this moves the needle for them at all. But, you know, put this against the backdrop, Kristen, of how many of the individuals we heard from today, every single one of them, save for the questioners, were people inside Trump's orbit, people inside telling the president in real time, you didn't win. There's not evidence of fraud. You're not going to win this election. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Um, the thing about Bill Stepien's testimony, even though it was just the videotape rather than live, was the kind of, you know, partially funny and partially abhorrent remark he makes that I was part of Team Normal and <laughs> on the president's team there was also Team Crazy. It's abhorrent to think that, as Bill Stepien describes, Team Normal wasn't getting any traction with President Trump. Only Team Crazy was getting into his eardrums. The folks like Rudy Giuliani and other lawyers and allies associated with him who kept telling the president there's a way to victory, including that, you know, gripping night of election night, which we've reported uh, in our book, um, which is... Rudy Giuliani is announcing, looking kind of tipsy, but announcing to the crowd and to the president, just say you won in the middle of the night uh, of the election before everything is really done. While Bill Stepien is warning the other, from Team Normal comes the voice saying, don't announce any victory. It's too soon to tell. Wait till everything's counted. But what does President Trump go with? Team crazy. It was so stunning to hear multiple former advisors to the former president say that Rudy Giuliani was inebriated that night. We reached out to Rudy Giuliani and his legal team, by the way. We didn't hear back. Danny Savalas, I want to turn to you now. We heard uh, former attorney general Bill Barr. Uh, he had a lot to say, essentially saying over and over again, he told former President Trump uh, that these allegations of fraud were completely baseless. He also said that he told the former president the DOJ is not is an extension of his legal team. Take a listen. The president uh, said there had been major fraud and uh, that uh, as soon as the facts were out, the results of the election would be reversed. Then he got to something that I was expecting, which is to say that apparently the Department of Justice doesn't think that uh, it has a role of looking into these fraud claims. And I said, you know, that has to be the campaign that raises that with the state. The department doesn't take side in elections, and the department is not an extension of, of uh, your legal team. Danny, talk about the legality here. A number of committee members saying over the weekend they believe they're laying out a case uh, that the Department of Justice should look at and potentially pursue a criminal indictment. Yes, this was a national audience, but it was also an audience of one, and that audience member would be Merrick Garland, who now is a tough choice to make once the smoke clears from these hearings. Okay. So the question becomes, you know, Trump, we talk about what did he know? And then we talk about what did he really know? I mean, is he so delusional, the argument goes, that he couldn't have known that he lost and that maybe he believed the election was being stolen from him. But in the law, we talked about this this morning, there is a concept called willful blindness. Uh, the government in criminal criminal cases doesn't always need to prove that you absolutely 100 percent knew and intended that what you were doing would be illegal. It is enough often if you are willfully blind to the illegality of what you are doing. And that is what the committee is trying to lay out. And for folks who paid passing attention before, uh, now they're seeing all the times and all the authorities, including Barr and many other people, who told President Trump it's over. Danny, did the committee do a good enough job connecting those dots today? Because as you point out, they made the case that there was an avalanche of information and voices, a chorus of voices, telling him that these claims of election fraud were baseless. And that really is the question and what you're getting at. Is it willfully ignoring the reality that's been presented to him? Um, but did he think, hey, maybe I have a shot? It's easy for me to sit here and say that I believe, theoretically, if you look at the codes and statutes, that there is potentially evidence connecting the dots to Trump's knowledge with his actions, and that could be criminal. But the practical, when the rubber meets the road, mm. the real question is, does a career prosecutor who has their job in mind, do they feel strongly enough about this? Mm. If you're Merrick Garland, are you willing to take a risk to, to go after the biggest trophy uh, out there, which is a former president, knowing 
knowing that he has a number of different kinds of defenses, including the First Amendment, uh, lack of knowledge, other things. Remember that this was a one-sided hearing. This was more like a grand jury proceeding, which we don't normally see, but which is a one-way show. It is the prosecution show entirely. And that's what we heard here. We didn't really hear exculpatory evidence. We only heard inculpatory, bad evidence against who, someone who was obviously, in grand jury speak, would be considered the target. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point to lay out, that this is being conducted more like a grand jury. Really um, interesting, Dan. Brandy, I want to turn to you. We heard the former AG say that the theories pushed by former President Trump's team were, uh, to use a number of words, bogus, silly, and based on complete misinformation. We also heard uh, former White House officials talk about how they considered them nuts. Let's take a listen. You know, the theory was also completely nuts, right? I mean, it was a combination of Italians, the Germans. I mean, different things have been floating around as to who was involved. I remember Hugo Chavez in the Venezuelan. She has an affidavit from somebody who says they wrote a software in and something with the Philippines and uh, just all over the radar. Just all over the radar. Brandy, can you walk us through what were some of the theories that were being pushed and spread at this point? And how were they being spread? Well, um, we counted at the time, this was in November, we were counting the number of distinct narratives that made up the election fraud disinformation campaign. And we counted dozens of different narratives that made them up. And it was really, you know, I, I can feel his frustration because it was a barrage of baseless nuts claims, you know, it was throwing spaghetti at the wall. So we were told by right-wing blogs and, um, you know, people like Rudy Giuliani and QAnon influencers like Sidney Powell and then the president himself, um, that ballots had been destroyed, that they had been dumped um, by trucks in, in Pennsylvania, that they had been switched somehow, that they had been lost somehow, that they had been found somehow, um, that voters were voting who were undocumented or from out of state or using their maiden name or were dead. And, you know, the culprits were really just as varied, you know, blamed voters, the media, um, election workers, Democrats, machines, software. I mean, how much time do we have? So, <laughs> but when you have this like random nonsensical narrative, it really is hard to combat the onslaught effectively because it's basically like choose your own adventure. Mm -hmm. And what sticks is different from each person. So I thought it was really effective at the end of the hearing. We heard a little bit from rally goers on January 6th, why they were there. You know, they were asked what they were doing there. And each one had their own specific story for how the election had been stolen and why they weren't going to take it anymore and why they were there to avenge it. I think you bring up a really important point, Brandy, which is that so many of these theories wound up being repeated by the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. And that is why the committee decided to end with that video today, to hear the rioters in their own words, to try to connect some of those dots. And Carol, to that point, you've been reporting on this stuff uh, for months, if not longer. Do you think, based on your reporting, that the former president really believed these conspiracy theories or, again, did he know that he had lost, but he was trying to find a way to stay in office? You know, the only way I can answer that question, Kristen, and it's the central question, is to say, I can't get inside Donald Trump's head. And I have tried. I interviewed him at Mar-a-Lago after he was in exile and no longer president with my great colleague, Philip Rucker. I felt that the president's the former president's position when he was president was to basically, every time someone told him one story was false, for him to raise up another uh, theory about fraud that occurred in Pennsylvania. And if Bill Barr told him that's not true, he raised another thing about a truck in Georgia or a suitcase under uh, Fulton County election ballot counting office. You know, every single time someone tried to whack a mole one little mole down, he had another mole that sprang up. My sense is that he knew he was losing. He knew that there were serious people in front of him telling him this is BS. Yeah. He had to, just as his daughter has testified, 
he had to respect their position because they had actually independently investigated it. One of the most powerful parts of today's testimony was former U.S. attorney in Georgia uh, completely discounting the fraudulent way in which Rudy Giuliani used a partial clip of a video to claim that votes were stolen in Fulton County, Georgia. That former federal prosecutor said when they reviewed the entirety of the videotape of the election counting, it was clear no fraud had been involved at all, that this was not a suitcase of ballots illegally counted for Biden. And it's that moment when you see that one of the president's allies is fudging sort of the video, tampering with the evidence to make their claim, where you start to see the intent and the knowledge that this is bogus. Yeah. Um, I would also say another important point that we haven't talked about yet is the issue of the fundraising. The fundraising claims that are made in this hearing today are really intriguing to me because the fact pattern is so similar to the criminal charges that were brought against Steve Bannon. Fundraising mm -hmm. on something you know is false. Fundraising on something that you end up you know, lining the pockets of yourself and your allies. That is a really interesting case that, that I'm sure Merrick Garland is watching closely. Yeah, well, Carol, I'm so glad you raised that and you take me to the exact question that I had actually for Danny. Danny, pick up on that point. Where does the fundraising piece of this fit into how the Department of Justice may be viewing these hearings? Yeah, watch this spot because this came up in the beginning. They loaded it at the end. And it's true. This is the same thing they went after uh, Steve Bannon over. Mm. This is the kind of thing that the Trump organization, that kind of uh, uh, format when it comes to raising money, whether it be Trump University, all kinds of those shenanigans that predated the presidency, they seem to be back when it comes to fundraising. And that is going to be an issue I think we have not heard the last of. That's why I think we saw it at the beginning and again at the end. Yeah, and the committee made the point that the funds were not going to where they were stated to be. Okay, fantastic conversation. Ali Vitali, Brandy Zadrozny, Carol Lenning, and Danny Savalos, thank you all for being here. And coming up, if the January 6th committee is laying out a potentially criminal case, the fallout across American politics could be staggering. My panel is here to discuss that and more next. And later, battleground voters gear up for Election Day. We've got the latest in a key battleground for control of the Senate ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The January 6th committee continues to lay out its case that former President Trump was at the center of attempts to overturn the 2020 election, all while the country looks ahead to the 2020 midterm elections. For more on the political fallout of these hearings, I'm joined here on set by Noah Rothman, associate editor at Commentary Magazine and an MSNBC contributor. Also with us from Washington, Faz Shakir, senior advisor to Bernie Sanders. Thanks to both of you for being here. So, Noah, I want to start with you, get your takeaways and and also, how do you anticipate Republicans are going to deal with these hearings as we get closer to the midterms? I was looking today at online reaction, and it seems like the strategy is to pivot to gas prices, to pivot to inflation, obviously the biggest issue for Americans. But these hearings are still looming. Yeah, I think it would be political malpractice for Republicans to take their eye off the primary drivers of voter enthusiasm, all of which surround pocketbook issues. Um, but it would be a mistake, I think, entirely to dismiss these proceedings, in part because what we are learning is revelatory mm -hmm. and has profound impact on the future of the republic. The, what we... What we saw today was sort of a rehashing of a lot of what was established, with new testimony from Barr, nevertheless, rehashing of what was established on Thursday night, namely that the president had no reason to believe his claims of fraud were legitimate and a lot of reason not to believe it. That establishes malice. It also establishes in the minds of his supporters the reason why they were there. It's important to, to, to tease that out. Uh, but some of the biggest revelations that we heard on Thursday night, at least allegations that we heard on Thursday night, were not touched today. And I'm waiting to hear them sussed out. What's the top one for you? Well, among them, Liz Cheney said there's the seven-point plan. I want to hear more about the seven-point plan. My primary concern, and one that has been just alleged and not supported sufficiently for my taste, is that on the day of this event, the president, in the three-some-odd hours where this was happening, simply ceded his control over military, over the National Guard, which reports directly to the president in Washington, D.C., and the vice president 
to whom these powers cannot devolve constitutionally, simply assumed them. And the Pentagon responded. And that, to I, me, is a breakdown of the constitutional order. Yeah, and I think on Thursday, when the focus will be on the pressure campaign on the former vice president, we may learn more about that. We'll have to see. Um, but I think that you are right. Clearly, um, this is a moment where the committee bears the burden of trying to connect all of the dots that they laid out in that first hearing. Faz, let me turn to you now, uh, because Democrats are signaling they are going to weave these hearings into their broader midterm messaging. I've been talking to sources who tell me, look, it's not going to be the key focus. We know Americans care about inflation and gas prices. At the same time, they believe it fits into a broader narrative of what President Biden has called ultra-MAGA Republicans. But how much of a risk is there in that? I mean, there's a decent amount of risk because I think you got to tie it to some narratives that are relevant to voters now. So we can look back into the past and and talk about the, op, the the moment we may have lost our democracy, and that's very real, and the salacious details will be painful to witness and observe. But the question that I think most voters would ask is, so what does this have to do with the vote in 2022? And, you know, as I wrestle with it, I would, I, I've tried to think about at least three areas that if Democrats were thinking about narratives that they might want to advance. One is just, it's a matter of judgment, you know? And, and if you make this about judgment, do you trust the Republicans' judgment if they can't concede that they lost, if that they're going to kind of kowtow to the big lie? So there's a judgment question. There's also a misplaced priorities question. Is it, if you put them in charge, would they have the right priorities? Would they be fighting for you? Or would they be too worried about carrying on the grievances of Donald Trump or others? And then the third is around the corruption of government. So even if you, you know, however you might feel about this, do you want the government being corrupted in the manner that it was by Trump and his cronies to, to, to make money off of it, to see them sell books, to, to try to sell literally lies to the American public, that, that there's a corrupting of our government? I think, you know, if you can tie it to something re related to the Republican agenda, you might have a better chance. But I'd say all that cash caveating that you still have to stay focused on the number one, two, and three issues, which, quite frankly, are not the, the, the committee hearings. Yeah. And, Faz, let me just follow up with you very quickly, because when I talk to Republican sources, they tell me, look, we're going to say this is Democrats wasting precious time and not being focused on issues like inflation. Could that be a further drag on the party, potentially? Well, I, I think if you are showing that you're making government work, right, if, they, if you think about the Democratic brand. The Democratic Party is supposed to stand for competent, functional government. And certainly that was a core part of what President Biden was telling coming back into office, a return, a return to normalcy. Uh, let's calm the waters, essentially. And so if you can make sure that the hearings are really an effort to try to have accountability in government to make sure that it functions well, then I think, yeah, you do have an argument to say, hey, you know, listen, we, we just need the government to work right. But I, I don't think that people are going to fully believe you unless and until you also capture doing something about their number one, two, and three priorities. You've got to deal with the economy and pass this gun legislation, deal, uh, you know, with more pocketbook issues that Noah's referencing. If you can't do those, I don't think you get rescued by focusing on competent, functional government because people are just upset about the nature of government itself. I'm going to go out into the field and talk to one of our reporters in a moment, but Noah, your response to what Faz is saying? Yeah, I think there's more risk than reward here for Democrats. And we saw a lot of this in the original impeachment proceedings. There was a lot of foot dragging about going through another impeachment process because it precluded legislating. It precluded a lot of the work of government, competent government that Reyes is talking about. And what we're seeing here as albeit a very important, I think, process just for posterity alone, the mm -hmm. momentous weight of this event precludes us from ignoring it. But nevertheless, is there political upside here for Democrats? No, I do not see it. Quite and, a bit of downside. And that is what the committee members will tell you, that they are laying out the historical record of what happened on January 6th. While we're discussing the political fallout of these hearings, NBC's senior political reporter John Allen is in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where he spoke to some voters. And of course, the vice chair of the committee, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, is up for re-election. How closely are voters out there watching what's happening on Capitol Hill? Not that closely, Kristen. I think the reason is 
uh, that they have already made up their minds in a lot of ways. That said, no one has more at risk, speaking of what you were just talking about with the panel, nobody has more at risk than Liz Cheney and leaning into this January 6th investigation. And when you talk to people here about that investigation, whether or not they're watching it, most of them are really unhappy with her about it. However, here in Jackson, which is a little bit of a blue dot in a red sea, um, you get a little bit more of a mix of opinion. And uh, we can listen to some of that now. I'm a Democrat, but I'm going to switch parties when I vote. We're allowed to do that here, so I can vote for, for uh, Liz. Like I say, she's brave. I think she's courageous to do what she's doing, but I don't agree with her, her politics. I don't agree with the fact that she kind of betrayed Trump. She doesn't represent the people that, that want her there. Like, she's supposed to be conservative and for what common people want. She's not playing that role at all. And Christian, what you uh, hear from even Liz Cheney's allies is that they think she has an uphill battle to re-election. Her opponents think it's more like the mountain behind me, much steeper, much larger. <laughs> um, what, we're, uh, what we're witnessing here, though, is a congresswoman who is really uh, willing to go after President, former President Trump in these uh, January 6th hearings. And I think the question is going to become uh, whether that is a, a viable electoral strategy. Right now, it doesn't look that way um, as compared to a strategy that puts her in a better position, gives her a bigger platform as either a presidential candidate in 2024 or as the leader of uh, a faction of the Republican Party outside of electoral politics. Yeah, well, speaking of mountains, John Allen, I think you win for the best backdrop. We'd all swap places with you in a minute. Thank you for your great analysis and interviews from the field. Noah, pick up um, on where John leaves off. Just big picture here, um, because, of course, we're watching Congresswoman Liz Cheney quite closely. But we're also wondering what this might mean for Trump himself. We know that he's considering another run in 2024. There's some concerns among moderate Republicans he may announce as soon as this summer. They're worried that that could actually hurt their chances in the midterms. But do you think this hearing could actually diminish some of his report? Could it make it tougher for him to run? That is very difficult for me to see. It's quite possible. I don't think anything would dissuade him from running if he's convinced that he has to run, particularly if he feels like he has to, know, to announce in the summer before a midterm election year intended entirely to freeze the field of potential Republican opponents because he's afraid of them, because he's afraid that they have the wind at their backs and he does not. So he has to get out early, get out now. Um, uh, Representative Cheney is facing an uphill battle, and I don't think she's going to survive. Um, we have a mixed bag of results so far from the primaries when it comes to Trump endorsements, Trump non-endorsements. This is when I think we're going to send a very clear and unambiguous signal, particularly when it comes to the January 6th committee hearings. And anybody who lent them any legitimacy is going to be punished by the Republican electorate. That's what makes it that much more important. And, and Faz, let me give you the final word here and have you weigh in on President Biden. Uh, as you know, there is some skepticism within the Democratic Party about whether he will run again in 2024. He says he will. And about whether he should, in fact, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was asked over the weekend if she would support him in 2024, and she said, we'll have to take a look at it. So she wouldn't even commit. Do you think that President Biden would have a broad base of support among Democrats if he decides to run again, which he says he will? Yeah, especially if, if, if it were Donald Trump and it was a rematch, I do think you'd have the same kind of consolidation. You have a lot of people fired up to put him back into office and ensure that Donald Trump doesn't win. I think that, you know, if Donald Trump wants to get in early and announce early, and none of us know how that guy thinks, but I assume he's probably worried about Ron DeSantis and his polling within the Republican Party, so he'd probably want to beat DeSantis to the punch and, and announce first his hope that he could scare him off. So if that were the case, yeah, you set up a situation where, I, quite frankly, it might be the major thing compelling Biden to want to run again because it also may be the case that he's he feels like a term is enough and he may be thinking uh, to let other people have a shot in 24. But I could imagine him being mobilized around saying, you give me Trump, I'll take him down one more time. <laughs> he's already signaled that exact same sentiment. All right. Faz Shakir, Noah Rothman, thank you both so much for a fantastic conversation. John Allen, thanks to you as well. Up next, we're one day out from Election Day and former President Trump's Senate pick in Battleground, Nevada, is leading polls by double digits in a race to challenge one of the Democratic Party's most vulnerable senators in November. You're watching Meet the Press Now.
Welcome back. As primary voters in Nevada, Maine, North Dakota, and South Carolina prepare to head to the polls tomorrow, all eyes are on Nevada, where Republicans see an opportunity to flip an all-important Senate seat in November. Former Nevada Attorney General Adam Laxalt is facing off against retired Army Captain Sam Brown in the Republican Senate primary. The winner will have a chance to take on Democratic incumbent Catherine Cortez Masto, whose seat is seen as vulnerable. Now, according to a Nevada Independent poll conducted last week, the Trump-endorsed Laxalt enjoys a double-digit lead over Brown heading into tomorrow's election. Joining me now with more on the Nevada Senate primary is NBC's Guad Venegas from Reno. Guad, thanks so much for being here. Look, polls are showing Laxalt still leads Sam Brown by double digits, as we just said. But Brown has narrowed this gap a little bit in the last few months. Is there any scenario where this could flip? Uh, Kristen, that is correct. And their own internal polling suggests that that 14 point lead could be within the margin of error. So his campaign is working hard. And we spent the weekend with both candidates, uh, Adam Laxalt speaking to voters in Nevada and in towns outside of Nevada with the same message where he's blaming the Democrats for everything that's wrong in the state. Inflation, high gas prices, uh, the cost of housing. Uh, meanwhile, Sam Brown was knocking on doors. His message is a little more moderate. And he does say that uh, Adam Laxalt is more of a showman. Sam Brown thinks that if he were to be elected to the Senate, he can really uh, create change and push for legislation that will benefit Nevadans. Here's part of the conversation that we had with Sam Brown. Adam Laxalt has relied on you know, political celebrities to come in and, and do a lot of the heavy lifting for him. Political celebrities don't do anything for Nevadans, especially when they're from out of state. Um, so, you know, People have been burned by, uh, you know, people who are more concerned about uh, their Twitter followership or if they've got enough views on Facebook or Instagram. Um, you know, that doesn't deliver results for an American people that are frankly hurting. So both candidates trying to win the votes of Republicans in Nevada so that they could move on and face Catherine Cortez Masto. And then that would be the hard part, right, because they would have to win the votes of the large number of nonpartisan, undecided voters that are here in Nevada, Kristen. Let me ask you, Guad, and it's great to hear that interview you did with Sam Brown. Well done there. Um, one of our colleagues, Natasha Karecki, reported on the, quote, Trump fatigue that has been bubbling up in a number of different states, including in Nevada. Are you getting a sense that that is happening in Nevada? And could that be generating this 11th hour push for Brown? So uh, for the primaries, the attention is focused on Republicans in Nevada, right? Registered Republicans are the ones that are going to vote in these primaries. And Republicans here still support Trump. And as we've seen in the polling, uh, uh, Adam Laxalt is ahead. So these hardcore Republicans that supported Donald Trump are still, from these polls that we've seen, supporting Adam Laxalt. So it is going to be difficult for someone like Sam Brown, who's a little more moderate. He does believe that people uh, will support him. So we'll have to wait and see the results. But as of now, now, not only did Donald Trump endorse Adam Laxalt, uh, Ron DeSantis, who's a personal friend of his, also came to Nevada and campaigned with Adam Laxalt. And uh, the Republicans in the state have shown their support for him. Yeah, and those endorsements certainly do make a difference. Great reporting. NBC's Guad Venegas in Nevada. Thank you so much. And still ahead, new details on gun legislation. Democratic Senator Martin Heinrich helped broker the bipartisan agreement. He joins us to talk about what's in the framework and what's not. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. A bipartisan group of senators reached a deal for a framework on new gun legislation yesterday, planning to take action in the wake of deadly mass shootings at that supermarket in Buffalo, New York, and the elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. The group has not written the full text of the bill, but here what was is what was included in the deal. Incentives for states to pass red flag laws to keep weapons out of the hands of people a court has deemed dangerous. Enhanced background checks for gun buyers between 18 and 21 and funding for mental health, also school safety. The framework also includes provisions that close loopholes in gun policies for domestic abusers and criminalizes purchasing a gun for someone barred from buying one themselves. 
Longtime gun reform advocate Democrat Chris Murphy and Texas Republican John Cornyn led the group, which now includes 10 Republicans, making it possible for the potential bill to meet the Senate's 60 vote threshold once it's brought to a vote. I'm joined now by one of the senators who helped broker this deal, Democratic Senator from New Mexico, Martin Heinrich. Senator, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Oh, it's great to be with you. So let's talk through what is in this deal and what is not. The compromise does not include some of the big things that Democrats had been pushing for, that President Biden had been pushing for, including raising the age to buy an assault weapon. So how big of a step forward is this in the fight for gun reform? Well, it's a, a first step. It is a big first step. This, this, if we can pass this, would be the biggest thing to happen since the assault weapons ban was passed in the 1990s. And there are a number of provisions in this, including with respect to domestic violence, the enhanced background checks, trafficking and straw purchaser language that will absolutely save lives. And so I think this is a very important first step. Senator, it's not clear, though, that even if this legislation were in place, that it would have stopped the massacres in Uvalde or Buffalo. What do you say to argue that those who argue, I should say, that these changes just don't go far enough? That the more we're able to actually engage on this issue and, and change policy as opposed to just viewing it as a political battle for one side or the other, the more we'll be able to do and the more lives we'll be able to save. I've heard time and again, uh, you know, when we have these conversations, oh, that law wouldn't have fixed this particular shooting. I think the way that we should be viewing this is as many things as we can do to reduce gun violence, because every single life we save is everything for a family somewhere. Do you think that if this does become a law, do you think this would have prevented the massacres, though, that the country has just witnessed? I know that it could have prevented some shootings. When you look at being able to find someone uh, in the database, in the NICS database, who has had previous issues that should raise flags, uh, the enhanced waiting period is something that is going to help with that. In addition, you know, we've seen in my state uh, the incredible amount of gun violence in neighboring Mexico that comes from firearms trafficked from the United States. I think it would be shocking for most of your viewers to know that while it's illegal and prosecutable to traffic guns into the United States, it's actually not illegal to traffic them out of the United States. Mm -hmm. There are so many common sense things that we've been able to include in this legislation that will absolutely help law enforcement prevent more gun violence. So in terms of the numbers, 10 Republican senators signed on to agreeing to this bill. None of them are on the ballot this year. What do you think that says about the political dynamics around this issue, particularly when you look at the polls, Senator, when the vast majority of Americans support provisions like expanded background checks and red flag laws? Well, I think we were looking for people who were genuinely willing to engage and not uh, use this for a re-election campaign. And, and that's what happened this time around that was different, is people came together and were not stuck in their, their previous positions. They were willing to say, what can we do to show the American people we can govern, that we can start this conversation and do things that will matter? And that is why you see some of the names that you see. I mean, I'm not up for re-election either, but boy, if I could go home to my constituents, to people who have been victims of gun violence and say, we are doing this, this, and this that is going to change things. I know it's not everything, but it's a start. That, that would be the most progress we've seen in decades. Yeah. So you have 10 Republicans. Can you guarantee that you will hold every single Democrat and that once this is legislative text, once it's a bill, that it will become law? You can never guarantee, but I feel very good about where this framework landed. And the fact that you have Chris Murphy, who has been such a champion of gun reform in our caucus, leading the negotiations, that speaks very well for being able to hold our members. And the fact that we have 10 Republicans is something we've never seen since I've been in this body. So I am very hopeful about being able to move forward. So, so just to put a fine point on this, you're confident you'll hold all Democrats, but you're not 100 percent certain. 
Well, I haven't spoken to every single member, but you have the real advocates for gun reform on the inside of these negotiations. So I don't think Democrats are going to be a challenge here. Uh, we're obviously going to have to hold all 10 of those Republicans, and hopefully we can build on that base and actually show the American people that we can get something done on gun reform. And, Senator, there's no legislative text yet. Are you concerned that there will be obstacles along the way that could ultimately derail its passage? How quickly do you think you could get this passed, ultimately? Well, people have been negotiating the, the fundamental legislative text from the very beginning. These are not new issues that just got on the table within the context of these negotiations. There have been multiple bills from both sides of the aisle dealing with these issues. And so we've had paper to trade right from the start. Uh, I think that process is moving very quickly. Uh, you know, those, those things are being drafted as we speak with both sides constructively at the table. So I do think we will get legislative text. Very quickly, just so we put a fine point on it, when do you think it will pass ultimately? What's the timeline you're looking at? Uh, weeks, not months. Okay. Senator Martin Heinrich, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And coming up, America's gun violence epidemic. A doctor weighs in on why she thinks guns are a public health issue. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Gun violence in America isn't just a policy issue. It's a public health one, too. In addition to the horrific mass shootings we've seen over the past month, guns are a major contributor to homicides and suicides in the U.S. According to Pew Research, in 2020 alone, over 45,000 Americans died of gun-related injuries. I'm joined now by Dr. Megan Rainey. She's a practicing emergency physician and an academic dean at the Brown University School of Public Health. Dr. Rainey, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I just want to get your gut reaction to this framework that was announced yesterday. You've obviously been working in gun reform for a long time. How big of a first step is this? That's how the senator just described it. Yeah, this is a tremendous and really important first step. We have been decades without any federal progress on policies that we know make a difference to reduce firearm injuries and deaths. The closing of the so-called boyfriend loophole alone cannot be overstated in terms of its importance. The leading reason for women dying in this country is because of intimate partner or domestic violence homicide, and most of those happen because of a gun. Closing that boyfriend loophole, allowing firearms to be temporarily or permanently removed from domestic violence perpetrators will reduce the number of firearm deaths of women, will reduce firearm suicides, and will reduce firearm homicides. And that's not even mentioning all of the other policies that are in this proposed group of legislative actions. You know, it, it's notable. The proposal essentially gives states incentives, funds, to enact red flag laws, but it does not federally mandate red flag laws. Do you think, if this bill were to have been a law in place, that it could have prevented these mass shootings that we've been covering in recent months, like the ones in Buffalo and Uvalde? You know, there's no single law that is going to stop every shooting. From my background, both as an emergency physician and as a public health researcher, I know that reducing the toll of any injury or illness takes lots of different things, both policies and community action. A red flag law may have made a difference, but I know that red flag laws are actively making a difference in the 20 states that have them. They're reducing suicides. They're serving to stop school shootings. We have documentation of the use of red flag laws to do that, and they reduce the risk of domestic violence, homicides, and other firearm uh, deaths. So I would be hopeful. Can I guarantee it? No, but it sure as heck is a step in the right direction. Yeah. What are the next steps that you would like to see? Let's assume this legislation passes. Where do you want lawmakers to put their focus next? What should be at the top of the list? So I think that assumption is a big one. Seeing this package turned into legislation that gets voted on and turned into law would be tremendous. But once we do that, we then have to enforce it. 
listen, there's so much data out there that unfortunately the policies that we already have are not actually put into place, are not actually enforced. People don't even know that red flag laws exist in many states. So that's part one. And then we have to continue to create communities for change. One of the things that I think is most extraordinary about this package is the bipartisan nature of it. It brings together firearm owners and non-firearm owners, red state and blue state politicians, Republicans and Democrats, to say together that gun violence is a public health issue and we will not tolerate guns killing people and being misused in this country anymore. So I need to see more of that community, more of that community change going forwards. Well, and you lead me to my next question. It's interesting. Senators have said that they've actually received more calls from gun owners after the Buffalo and Uvalde shootings than they've seen after other mass shootings. And I wonder, you've heard a lot of people say that this moment has to be different after Uvalde, after that horrific massacre at that school. Do you think we are witnessing and experiencing a cultural shift? I think whether we experience a cultural shift is honestly up to us. I've been working on this issue for almost 15 years now. I helped start a nonprofit that represents partnerships between gun owners and non-gun owners committed to preventing the misuse of firearms, prevented to, to, or excuse me, committed to preventing injury and death from firearms. I know that it is possible, but we each have to stand up and say that we are going to reach across the aisle and do this critically important work. Um, well, that's how change in America gets done. Well, we really appreciate your insights this afternoon. Dr. Megan Rainey, thank you so much. And thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News with Hallie Jackson is next. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.